Okay, good morning to all of you. Professor Ogai has already introduced about the pipe inspection robots for sewer pipelines and I am going to talk about the importance and application of pipe inspection robots for gas and oil pipelines. What are the, what are the places in general where pipeline you know inspection robots or in abbreviation the PIR is used. Uh, as you can see that energy related utilities like fuel, gas or oil supply lines and heat pipes for nuclear and thermal power plants, then the portable water transportation and drainage water transportation. These are the four uh, most important you know areas of application for the uh, PIR pipe inspection robots out of which. Uh, Professor Ogai has already thank you, uh, talked about the drainage water transportation and uh, I am going to talk about the energy related utilities like fuel, gas or oil supply lines. Heat pipes for nuclear and thermal power plants is also a very good very rich field of application. In fact, first series of pipe inspection robot was actually designed for nuclear power plants to investigate if there is leakage in the pipeline. Okay. So, the earliest reference of pipe investigation robots that we find in the literature is related to nuclear power plants. So, however, we will mostly talk about the energy related utilities like fuel, gas or oil supply lines. So, our focus is for gas and oil pipelines and here is a network of gas and oil pipeline as you can see here that starting from the offshore production you need pipelines for separations where the you know the fractional distillations occur and then it goes to processing and then the it goes to various storage areas and also from there onwards it also comes to the transmission pipelines. So, it is mostly the transmission pipelines where we are right now developing the applications and here mostly the uh, gas you know phase of the flow that is what we are mostly actually working on. However, there are many other applications where people work on the you know uh, liquid based for example, the oil pipelines itself. As you know that this compressed natural gas is depending on the pressure level, you can either operate it in a fluid level, liquid level or you can operate it at the gaseous level. Okay. So, let us go to the next slide. As you can see here that uh, the oil and gas there are various parts in it like the pipelines, there are other facilities there. and when we talk about the pipeline operation itself. Now, this is the data of United States of America. Unfortunately, in India I have so far not obtained any such data line, but in United States the natural gas line is 3218,000 kilometers k kilometers. Okay. So, what professor Ogai had shown the sewerage line data similarly you can see that how many times of the circumference of the earth you know is covered by the natural gas pipelines. They say that the advancement of a civilization is measured in terms of the extent of the pipelines. Okay. So, this is what shows that how you know extensive is this natural gas lines. Out of these lines the transmission line is 480 to 1000 kilometer distribution line is about 2735,000 kilometers and gathering line from the source is about 45,000 kilometers. Other than that, so this is about the gas pipeline specifically, there is this hazardous liquid where the transmission uh, is of course, of a little lower level, but still these are of very significant level. So, this is just to tell you what is the level of problem that we are handling if you just you know 
consider at one country itself what is the level of problem that we are actually uh, you know trying to tackle. Let us go to the next slide. So, why do we need pipe health monitoring in these pipelines? Having acknowledged that these pipelines are very extensive, the pipelines have very limited life. Why they have limited life? The first important point is that there is always a cyclic variation of internal pressure that is happening in the system. Why is it happening? Because when you are sending gases through the inlet pressure, you are maintaining a particular pressure level and then the gases are continuously being consumed by different industry. Now, different industry consume the gas at a different rate, because the manufacturing process demands you know different uh, rate of consumption. So, in the output there is always a change of the outlet gas pressure. As a result there is always a variation that is happening on the internal pressure. So, if there is a variation in the internal pressure there is something called low cycle fatigue and these gas pipelines are always subjected to low cycle fatigue. Now, these pipelines being mostly steel pipelines this low cycle fatigue actually changes the nature of the material itself. So, that is what is one of the major problem. Then of course, there is always unpredicted change of thermal stress. Okay. Even though as Professor Ogai said for example, sewer uh, you know pipelines are generally designed for 50 years. In India uh, for example, the Gale and others they design the pipelines from 50 to 75 years. Even though they do that for 50 to 75 years, but the type of thermal stress that is generally considered may get suddenly change because of various reasons. For example, uh, one important reason could be the nature of change of the gas temperature itself. Okay. The other reason could be uh, the frost lines, okay. the weather you know suddenly gets changed. So, you cannot predict it that when there will be a frosting and you have to take into account that our pipelines go through various regions uh, which are subjected to either frost line or intensely high temperature. So, in both the cases this change of temperature will generate unpredicted level of thermal stress on the system. The third point is the dynamic vertical loading. Dynamic vertical loading is a very critical thing. What it happens is that uh, many of the places these pipelines go below the actually roads you know or the railway lines. So, as it crosses the roads and the railway lines there will be always vehicles that will be coming over and that will create a change in the vertical loading on the system. That becomes significant because this comes as an impact load and hence it affects the uh, life of the pipeline. Then of course, there are natural processes of degradation such as oxidation and corrosion of the pipe surface. The all these transmission companies take lot of care in terms of maintaining the electrical you know so to say neutrality of the pipeline with respect to the soil condition. So, that there is no anode cathode development and the corrosion should not take place. So, they always maintain a voltage level and they monitor that voltage level, because that uh, voltage uh, difference between two points indicates that whether there is any corrosion taking place or not. But still there are you know oxidation and corrosions which may not be so much because of the outside condition, but maybe because of the inside condition the type of fluid that it is carrying that can actually create various types of oxidations and corrosions of the pipe surface. Then there is another problem that is the joint failure due to abrasion, because there are these you know all these gas pipelines even though it is only supposed to carry the natural gas, but there will be always pollutants in it. And these pollutants particularly at the bends they actually create joint failures due to abrasion. Finally, there is one very interesting point that we noted uh, in terms of flow induced vibration. What happens is that couple of years before we had an experience like this that there is a river stretch Ramganga stretch and uh, there is a gas pipeline that was just by the side of this river. 
Now, what happened is that due to flood etcetera, this river has changed its course and as a result the pipeline which was initially uh, on the actually uh, soil itself which is outside the river stream suddenly got exposed to the river and hence this entire pipeline was actually inside the river stream itself. And if such a thing happens then you know that the pipeline actually works like a bluff body and on that bluff body the flow if it occurs then it actually creates a flow induced vibration on the system. So, that created a major problem for the gas pipelines uh, and there are various ways in which you can actually control such a problem. The way we have done it is a very indigenous way. We have actually uh, hang lot of you know sand bags uh, we, with the help of ropes etcetera on the pipe and we have used uh, something called spoilers that is something like a plastic ribbons to actually dissipate the vortices around the place. So, we have changed the mass that means we have changed the natural frequency of the system and we have used spoilers to increase the damping. So, that is what is the problem. Now, here uh, you know how important many of you are asking that how important are various considerations. Now, this data I have taken from a report uh, you know which uh, I will just show you next one or two slides, but this clearly shows that uh, uh, and that is from the Argonne National Laboratory report and this clearly shows that um, earthquake shaking, earthquake permanent ground deformation for example, fault rupture, liquefaction, landslide etcetera that has a very high effect on the transmission pipelines. Ground movements, landslides also has a very high effect. Flooding is generally a low effect does not occur that much of uh, you know that many times unless you take lot of you know uh, precautions in the laying out stage itself. Wind also not much, icing low probability, collateral hazard this I have told that this is a one of the major problem particularly this pipelines many a times passes by the mining areas and there will be always blasting in the mining area. So, if there is this blasting then because of that blast there will be shock waves which will go to the pipes and that creates the collateral hazards due to blast or fire. Then there is another collateral hazard possibility that is whenever there is a inundation of a dam suddenly a dam you know bursts out then the pipelines around will be subjected to huge amount of change of pressures etcetera. Human threats like physical attacks, biological, chemical, radiological blasts this is important particularly when you think of it that we are thinking of bringing gas now from Turkmenistan passing so many terrorist areas covered by Afghanistan, Pakistan etcetera. This is of a very important thing that how to save your gas lines from human threats. Now, hence you know there are these various hazards and transmission pipelines uh, to various degrees get subjected to such hazards. Similar things are also true for pumping stations, compression stations, processing facilities etcetera, but I am only focusing on the transmission pipelines right now. Now, what are the general techniques for the pipe health monitoring? The first uh, you know very extensively used technique is visual examination using inspection dig. So, whenever as I told you that the electric potential change occurs people actually you know make inspection digs and directly visually check what is the status of the pipeline. I think it is very popular in India that is why you get lot of potholes everywhere every now and then. Second is external measurements such as electrical survey which is what I just told you that change in the potential. Third is examination of corrosion coupons or probes placed inside the pipeline. So, this also actually is not a continuous checking, but you actually put it at certain places where you first suspect that you may have problem then you send this corrosion coupons or probes around that location and see that what is the level of uh, you know pipeline corrosion that has taken place. And finally, use of inline inspection tool to identify areas of pitting or metal loss. It is this inline inspection tool 
which will take us to these pipe crawling robots. Okay. So, that is what we will be focusing in this lecture series. Now, this is a pipe inspection gauge as I told you that uh, some of the data I had taken from the report of T C Ferris and R L Kolpa of the Argonne National Laboratory. And this is something that you can get from the internet freely available overview of the design construction and operation of interstate liquid petroleum pipelines. Okay. It is a fantastic you know piece of information you can you can you know anybody who is interested in terms of designing pipeline itself uh, you can get all the related information in this particular report. Okay. So, uh, what is generally done is that uh, there are actually you know uh, cleaning pigs there are couple of pigs pig is the abbreviation of pipe inspection gauges. Okay. So, uh, there are pigs which actually is first used in terms of cleaning of the pipeline itself and then once the cleaning of the pipeline is done then actually the actual data set that means the robots which carry the uh, measurement which actually measures uh, uh, you know data with respect to magnetic flux etcetera that is taken care of at the second stage. So, uh, let us go to the second stage of the peak. So, here in the second stage what you will be finding out is that uh, you know uh, first of all this accumulated sludge and debris uh, that is in the there in the inside wall of a pipe and then the pipe conditions such as corrosion. So, you are basically going to launch it from one of these you know mainline pipe. Uh, often there will be something in conjunction with a pump station you will see there is a small video where we will explain this process and the pig's outer diameter is generally the same or slightly larger than the internal diameter of the pipe. So, that a portion of the pig is compressed when it is placed inside. In most instances the pig is actually passive okay. active pigs are not very common particularly for gas power pipelines. Uh, definitely I think one of the reason is due to the fire hazards and the other reason could be that you have to run it for miles and miles. So, hence you know a passive system is more desirable. Now, there is a small video. So, let us uh, look into that small video. Uh, yeah, so, this one if you please click double click it just yeah. yeah. So, you just, just expand it. So, as you can see that this is a southern California you know so called right yeah their uh, video which is explaining that how this picking process is done. Okay. So, now the first part is to launch this picking uh, system it is not directly launched as you know uh, on the gas pipeline. Okay. So, first there will be an auxiliary pipeline where you have to launch this system that is what is getting done at this stage. No, let us let us see that whole process here. Yeah, let us see the whole process. Uh, as you can see here that this is the pig we are talking about and they are this is the launching process. Okay. It is absolutely crucial this fellow is showing its hand so that it gets fitted. Now we know because we are now running our robot in the pipe we know a little bit of off alignment can create a havoc on the robot. Okay. So, that is why there is no wonder that they try to fit it in such a manner that the robot is not subjected to any uneasy you know uh, unaccounted for stresses etcetera. So, this is there in the auxiliary pipeline now and they are now closing the pipeline uh, very soon there will be gas which will be flowed. So, the main line gas will be bypassed to this and that is what this process will start now the change of flow because uh, this robot is to be now taken inside the main pipeline and you have to maintain the same temperature pressure etcetera. So, you see this is going inside. Okay, so, it is first placed here. Now, they are retracting the system the gas is currently flown in this main line it is to be diverted and whatever left over you know air is there that is actually going out. Okay. So, now the gas is flowing in the this line itself 
and that is gradually the robot is brought here. Now this pig is actually going inside the main pipeline. Okay. So this is how it is moving below the ground cover most of the times. This is the magnetic flux line. So it is continuously checking the magnetic flux uh, leakage so to say on the pipe surface. It can go below the streams also and below the ground, below the roads etcetera. And there is an angle many times the angle can be something like 30 degree angle and this is the pipeline which is subjected to various kinds of conditions. So, they are getting a signal that where exactly is the location of the system. And as you can see now the robot is reaching to the second location destination. So, starting from the launching location it has it is now reaching the second location. Here again a very similar procedure is to be done. I see at each and every stage there has to be precaution that the gas flow should not be obstructed because then the commercial work will be obstructed. So, they will try to do it without obstructing the gas flow as much as possible. Now, the robot has just reached here is very critical at this stage that the robot is not subjected to too much of an impact at this location. So, you have to change this gas pressure you know gradually from some distance and now the robot will be retracted. For retraction you will see that the robot is stopped quite far away and they are taking a system to actually hook it. So, the yeah you can see the front part where this hooking is done and they are bringing this robot back. So, this is how a pick system generally works. So, once we go back to the slides now you see that this is one company which very extensively does this. This is the GE actually pipeline integrity services. They have a for example, a joint venture between GE oil and gas and Al Sahin to carry out such inline inspection. Uh, corrosion and metal loss characterization using magnetic flux based system. Also there is ultrasonic systems. I will talk about various types of such sensors in uh, one of these uh, you know lectures in future. Now not only uh, you have to detect the corrosion and metal loss, you have to also detect what is the position of the fault. For that they use actually various types of you know inertial uh, for example, IMUs uh, or something like GIS systems. Okay. So, there are two things that you can use one is that the GIS coordinate of the robot at various point of time and another is uh, various types of uh, MEMS based accelerometers or inertial measurement system units. Okay. So, that you know what is the speed and from which you can actually integrate and you can back calculate that how much of distance you have covered. This is particularly important whenever you will be losing the GIS signal because there is something called dead bit reckoning. Dead bit reckoning is a strategy that is used even in automobiles. So, whatever is your last point of GIS signal from there if your IMU data is available then you know that before you get the next GIS signal how much of distance you have covered without the satellite coverage. So, that is why IMU you know is definitely needed. And then there is crack management, location and sizing, geometry assessment solutions like dents, wrinkles, ovalities, you know, buckling or displacement of the pipe, all these data you know you will be able to actually get through this kind of a pigging system. This is something like a future, you know. I mean, once we started to work on there is this GT Silicon who worked with us uh, in terms of making the future architecture of such a system. And this actually shows you how complicated the entire system is. As you can see you should have multiple sensors. You should have pressure sensor, temperature sensor, humidity sensor. You should have a motion tracking module, a camera module, a flash memory, the motor control module if you have to control the speed. Then we have our own PVDF sensor which is which actually senses the deformation. We have an analog front end from all these systems. 
the data are coming in the analog then you need a ADC conversion and then store it in the microprocessor. You also must have a power management system which controls mostly the microprocessor. Uh, for motion control we normally do not try to use any power unless there is a something like an emergency situation where the robot got stuck and you have to retrieve the robot back. And we uh, also need uh, you know wireless communication system which Professor Ogai will be discussing later on. So, this actually shows the complicacy of the entire system. Now, there are in terms of the motion control of the system, there are two parts. One is the tracking generation or locomotion of the robot and another is the damage sensing system. So, we will mostly focus on the tracking generation or the locomotion part of it in the beginning and then we will talk about the damage sensing system. In the in the tracking generation part, there are three conventional locomotion systems. So, generally I would say there is some conventional locomotion and some non-conventional locomotion. Today Professor Panigrahi was talking about the motion, motion of the robot inside human artery for example. Now, this kind of they are also pipelines, they are very flexible pipelines and very small. So, this kind of pipelines require really non-conventional locomotions. You need some robotic systems, some ideas we will talk about it today, which are very, very non conventional. On the other hand, for the gas pipelines, conventional locomotions are pretty popular because of the simplicity of the design and the robustness of the design. So, uh, there are three types of conventional locomotion we will talk about wheel drive locomotion and the truck or tractor driven locomotion and fluid powered propulsion. Now, in the non-conventional locomotion, uh, you know they are used uh, for narrow as I told you that less than 100 millimeter diameter and wherever you have a complex network of pipelines. Okay. So, let us click in this particular one. Also note down the speed here, it is about 80 millimeter per second. Okay. So, if you look at it that this is a locomotion that has been designed with a single motor earthworm. Okay, it is based on the inchworm motion okay. and uh, what is used here is actually magnetostrictive you know actuation system which is actually moved in a sequence in such a manner that when one of the system is uh, you know holding the other is contracting and thus there is a sequence the of the whole thing. Okay. So, there is a active clamping and uh, there is another system which actually releases itself this things uh, can be designed with wireless you know for example, this is the wireless motion of the inchworm system. Okay. So, uh, and it can be also designed in a very miniature form this could be something that you know that can be used uh, in a very very small scale uh, in near future. Uh, however, right now it is wired that is as you can see. So, this is to be made wireless. So, there are various miniature things that people have developed or people are actually working on all over the world. So, this is just to give you some idea about non-conventional one. Let us go back to the uh, original slides now and uh, just uh, one more you know uh, slightly unusual one the smart ball system just have a look at it. Okay. Uh, if you can uh, if you can uh, yeah you just click it here please. Uh, okay. All right. So we will see it later on. Okay. Yeah. Let's go to the multi-legged system then. Okay. So this is also another non-conventional system. This is like a you know spider-like movement actually. And here, what you do is that the legs are used instead of wheels. For example, they are used to press against the pipe wall to provide enough traction for the robot. Now you have redundant links in this system. Why? Because based on the tactile sensing at the feet and the contact sensing along the legs, you will decide that which legs are to be released and which legs are to be applied for thrust generation. So, that is why you uh, instead of four legs, there will be many legs system and also there is a provision of changing the joint angles here. So, this is typically you know inspired 
is a bio inspired design from the spider like motions. That is about the non conventional one. So, let us go you know. So, this is like a multi legged systems as I told you that that actually judges the stability of the robot and based on that it actually talks about that which uh, pair of legs are to be used okay. and they can be used also in terms of passing through obstacles such as bends or diameter variations etcetera. Okay. So, let us go to the conventional one. Now, on the conventional one we have the wheel driven traction robot. These robots are generally used for large diameter pipes such as you know as professor Ogai has shown in the beginning as drainage pipes. They are also good for variable pipe diameters and high speed driving. Okay. So, as you have seen that earlier the speed that was there one of the non conventional one was about 80 millimeter per second, but here it is about 163 millimeter per second okay. and the speed is about 0.6 kilometer per hour. Okay. It is much much less than the walking speed, but you have to also keep in mind that we are not only for the speed, but also you have to complete the scanning process that is why the speed is not very high. Okay. So, yeah. So, the next slide actually uh, let us go to the next slide this shows you a typically you know a wheel drive traction robot as you can see that you have this industrial camera system. Uh, and the LED light sources for the illumination. There are some auxiliary LED light sources whenever there is damage you would need to do that. There is a lifting frame up and down to get a better view and there are pneumatic tires okay, so that you can actually run on the actually pipe and start, you know uh, get the video image. So, this is a video image based system. Now, for uneven and greasy or muddy pipe surfaces this kind of tire system may not be good. So, you may need a different type of traction. So, there you need a tractor or a truck driven you know system. Okay. So, these are more resource effective that this kind of wheel drives uh, and uh, they have a better load carrying capacity because the payload is very very important. However, they are generally slower than the wheel driven robots they are almost you know half the speed that is available than the wheel driven robots. This is a typical you know Versatrax 150 commercially available you know track driven system as you can see here that once again you know there are this the wheels are substituted by this you know uh, the track tra traction system the belt driven system and you have the video image processing system on the top and you can control the distance with the help of this kind of a mechanism. So, that is one of the commercially available system. What is mostly used in gas pipelines is the passive crawling system. So, this is a typical passive crawler. These systems are propulsion driven system and they are generally used with relatively large diameter water and gas pipelines because you can get more thrust out of it. For such applications these passive robots are developed because it is energy efficient. However, this is important that the weight of each module is limited by the kinetic energy available from the flow. So, what happens if your robot becomes very heavy then all you have to do is that you have to chop it into small small robots such that the thrust is good enough to carry each one of them. That is what is the design part which we will be discussing while designing the modularity of the robots. Yeah. So, this is a typical you know propulsion driven system as you can see that the thrust is coming from this side the gas thrust then uh, generally the you know magnetic flux based system is used here. So, there will be a series of magnetic flux generator which will be you know basically generating the magnetic flux and there will be hall sensors which will be sensing the magnetic flux. And uh, there is something which will definitely the microprocessors will be there for recording the data inside and also there will be uh, you know inertial measurement unit and uh, the tip is usually for that uh, you know uh, deployment of the robot okay. that is what the tip part is generally used. Now, you may note that everywhere the streamlining they have tried to maintain as much as possible so that you do not affect the 
flow pattern, you do not generate turbulence etcetera, then there will be loss in the system. So, this is a typical propulsion driven system uh, and uh, depending on as I told you that weight of the system, the number of wheels and the separation of the modules is what you have to design. So, the general challenges that will come out is that we are in tier due to long distance travel, okay. uh, continuous position monitoring because it is embedded inside the ground. So, how do you send the signal, how do you get it, slippery inner walls which may create unstable motion, turns and bends in the pipeline, non-uniform gas flow, turbulence of the gas flow and presence of corrosive agents. These are the challenges against which you have to design such a robot. Now, I just very briefly say that what does the robot carry in terms of sensing. There could be optical sensing like visual inspection, laser profiling or microwave sensing. Okay. So, these are all in terms of the optical sensing domain. There could be vibration and sound wave based sensing. For example, sonar profiling, ultrasonic sensing, PVDF based vibration sensing, particularly sonar profiling or ultrasonic sensing is very much popular whenever there is, there is you know fluids that is there in the system. This works in much much better manner. Then there are a range of indirect sensing for example, magnetic flux leakage okay, or Villari sensing or gas sensing. So, there are a, a range of sensors that these robots usually carry with it. So, this is a typical of a laser profiling sensor and this is a very high resolution sensing type as you can see that uh, you know basically what you are doing is that you are rotating a series of lasers uh, and then you are getting the reflection back and by using various things like laser doppler vibrometry is one of them. Then also you know triangulation type laser reflections you can actually make out that what is the profile of the pipe surface. So, and this is used for pipes ranging from 100 millimeter to 4 meter diameter. So, for a very large variation performing up to 250,000 measurements per minute. That is the kind of you know uh, precision and speed of the system, the, the accuracy is about plus minus 1 percent. So, laser profiling is something which is which is actually coming up, but of course, power is a problem for the whole system, but this is one of the uh, you know topmost sensors with which you can compare the performance of any other sensor. So, I just you know wanted to give you a very brief introduction to pi field monitoring robot. Uh, I have actually talked about what is the necessity of pipe investigation robots first of all, how typically a pig is run and then what are the various types of pigs for example, the traction driven one uh, and uh, the propulsion driven systems and some of the sensors that it carries. In the future talks we will talk more about okay, how each one of these individual systems work. Okay. Thank you. So, is there if there is any question then I can take up. Okay, so, if there is no further question, I think we will go ahead with Professor Ugai's second talk, right. Okay, thank you.